Good morning and welcome to the second Change Managers uh, Network webinar hosted by the Improvement Service. Um, can I just get a quick show of hands just to make sure that everyone can hear me loud and clear? All right. Okay, so we've got a couple in there, so if um, anyone can't hear me loud and clear, either use the questions box or the chat on the right hand side, and I will acknowledge your message at some uh, uh, when it comes through. So this uh, this talk will be recorded once again and will be shared um, with, all, with all attendees and all members of the Change Managers Network. Um, our talker today is David, David Waller, who is um, an expert in uh, benefits management. And the talk will be on the benefits of benefits management. So, just to uh, just to save some time, we'll uh, we'll hand straight over to David, and he'll take you through take you through his talk today. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the benefits of benefits management. Um, as David said, my name's David Waller. Um, I run Keldale Business Services. Um, I'm a one-man band consultant, working mainly with the NHS in England. At the moment, I'm benefits lead at Barnsley Hospital for their electronic patient record program. Um, the reason I'm talking today is in March, I did a workshop at Edinburgh Napier University on building benefits dependency networks. And following on from that, David asked me to do this webinar. Um, I'm going to cover sort of broader stuff than simply benefits dependency networks today because that was a bit of a practical exercise, which is a bit tricky to try and do over the web. Um, as David said, the slides and uh, everything will be available. There are speakers' notes behind the slides as well, so if I gabble through things too quickly, hopefully the actual notes themselves will explain things in a bit more logical form. So, let's set the scene. That's assuming that my slides decide to work. All right. Thank you. Right, the benefits led enterprise. Um, benefits management. Um, my history of benefits management is I've been doing it for about 20 years now. I picked it up at Cranfield University in the mid 90s when they were doing their research project, which started in why do IT projects fail? Um, from that, they proposed benefits management as a one of the solutions to fix that problem. They then expanded it from projects to program portfolio. Um, since then, I've taken it a little bit further. I think benefits management is something that can be applied across the entire enterprise. So what we've got here is a Venn diagram, because all these things do overlap with one another. Um, they, they don't sit in discrete little boxes. And it's based on the sort of inbound, inside, outbound, or sort of um, sell side, inside, buy side model that some people may be familiar with. The diagram in the bottom left-hand corner is a benefits dependency network, and I'll come to that in a few moments. But basically, the, the idea is that there are benefits management tools and techniques that apply across this diagram. Um, if we take things sort of, for example, the, opportunity, the options and choices, developing strategy and policy, the, the thing on the left-hand side. Um, advanced benefits management is a strategic business planning tool. So it enables senior managers to use a rational methodology for selecting and delivering successful strategies. Right. The drivers are going to be your organization's strategy, its objectives, its raison d'etre. And the context can be the who, what, and where of your local economy. That way, the plan that you get for a new strategy comes from the benefits that it delivers, not just people's pet projects, um, the value, the view of fair shares or, or face saving. Um, I used to work in BT for 20 years before I, I started sort of working within the health service, and so many projects were basically on the line of uh, there is a board of directors within the unit, yeah, and everybody gets one to do. They get shared out rather than because they are the right specific projects. Putting some, some sort of benefits behind it gives it a bit of a more rational focus. Rather than going through them all in, in turn, I'll pick out another one, so supplier relationships. An open dialogue with clear understanding of agreed joint aims and mutual benefits. So if both parties know actually what they're in it for and what they want to get out of it, 
helps to build a solid working relationship with the key suppliers. As a customer, the enterprise creates the right-hand side of this diagram. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouse moving around. Um, the drivers, the objective side. So as a customer, you say, this is what we want it to achieve. Presenting it to the supplier side means that they can then go away and look at the right-hand side, you know, what are the, the features and functionalities they're going to provide and how will it be used in practice. And in effect, it's a two-piece jigsaw puzzle where the two pieces meet nice and neatly. And because you're working together and you build this thing sort of on an iterative basis, it helps you build a working relationship as well. On the outward bound side of things, we can look at sort of what our customers do, solution development. Yeah. If we're dealing with innovation, disruptive technologies of new IT systems, we're faced with recurring questions about how it's actually going to be used. So again, working through the left-hand side of the benefits dependency network builds reasons for why. Now, why would we want to use this piece of equipment? Why would we want to use this solution? Now, I preset creating solutions in search of problems is bad, and we shouldn't do it. But often we find ourselves in a position where we're heading in that direction, whether we like it or not. Yeah. If we try and force a solution onto any problem that comes our way, that's wrong. However, using benefits networks provides a set of potential problems that we can then solve. So why benefits management rather than any other benefits, any other business methodology? Um, I'm sure, like me, you've probably been through a number of business cases, got to page 15, and you still don't know what it's all about. Very often, we get this sort of scenario. It says, you ask someone what they're doing, and the chances are is that they'll tell you how they're doing it. So what are you doing? We're working together as one enthusiastic team to deliver our project on time and in budget. So what is it? Well, it's a relational database of millions of records accessed by hundreds of concurrent users in millisecond response time. So what does it do? Well, it records transactions between suppliers and purchasers across the region. What's it for? Well, oh, don't know. So often, uh, again, perhaps it's just my bad experience in BT over many years, you know, I've hit projects of this nature. Terrific amounts of, of kit and whizzy piece of technology but we don't actually know what it's been used for or why it's being applied. So we use benefits management as an aid to setting good objectives. Yeah. So it's reasonable to expect that our objective will be something to do with bringing benefits to someone, even if it's purely selfishly to ourselves. So the definition here that, that I work from is a benefit is a result that a stakeholder perceives to be of value. And the key point here is the benefit needs a stakeholder, someone who sees its merit, and their perception is crucial. Now, the what's in it for me is a subjective judgment, but the more rationality we can put around that subjective judgment, the better the benefits are going to be. This is a definition of a benefit. It's not the definition of a good benefit. Right. Um, so issues of things like morality and ethics and relative value and perverse choices are, are subject of another lecture, obviously. But if we work from the basis of a benefit is a result that a stakeholder perceives to be of value, we're on the right lines. Likewise, benefits management itself, the best application of scarce resources to select and deliver appropriate benefits to identified stakeholders. Now, the best application of scarce resources is, in effect, a, a generic definition of management. It's the selecting appropriate benefits to identified stakeholders that sets benefits management apart as a methodology. And what do these definitions get us to? Well, they get us to three simple questions that ought to be asked about any project or any change initiative. And they're sort of fairly noddy questions, but they set sort of the definition of what it is and why it's worth doing. So who is it actually for? Who is it really, who are you doing this for? Who are your stakeholders that will get some value out of this project? What do they really want out of it? 
do they understand the value that they can get? Is it an appropriate amount of value? Is it the correct thing? Let's say perverse choices, wrong stakeholders. You know, we can go down some very bad dark alleys by picking the wrong people or not studying this too closely. And finally, what makes this choice better than the next alternative? And the, the, this is sort of the opportunity cost type things that the economists will talk about. But in simple terms, who's it actually for? What do they really want to get out of it? And what makes this choice better than the next alternative? So to do that, we have to start with the end in mind. Um, before I get to the benefits dependency network, there are two key points. I say where to start and when to stop. So let's start with objectives. An objective is a result with a purpose. There has to be a because statement in it somewhere, even if it's only implicit. Um, if you worked in retail, you may have a project that to build a new shop. The objective is not to build a shop, but to build a shop because that is where we will sell our products and make a profit. So the type of shop you build and the place, the location, you know, all that sort of stuff is going to be dependent on the fact that you need to sell your goods and make a profit. And if it doesn't enable you to do that, it's the wrong shop in the wrong place. So if we take this rather silly example, and as today's the 200th anniversary, I thought I'd do something appropriate. So why did Wellington fight at Waterloo? Option A, to defeat Napoleon convincingly, to remove the threat of France to the European peace for many a year, or to use up his old gunpowder before its sell-by date, or possibly something more personal to him, it's simply a failed insurance scam to get himself a new horse. He didn't in the end, his horse lived for years. <laughs> The reason we ask this question is, it's not only what you do, it's also why you choose to do it. As I said, the example with the shop, yeah, it's the because statement. Yeah, it's the reasons behind something that help you determine what it's going to look like, what the final solution is going to be. Therefore, it's very important to know what the end is that you've got in mind before you commit to a project. And just in case you weren't sure of the answer, it was A, obviously. In the same way as sort of knowing where to start, we also need to know when to stop. In this analogy, you've got a chessboard. A game of chess ends when you're checkmated and I've won. Only a very deluded chess player, or somebody who sort of thinks they're very, very good, is going to say the game ends when my pieces are in a specific position. My king's in g3, my queen's in c4, and etc. Yet often with projects, we put too much definition. We go too granular into the blueprint at the end. So the success criteria get very, very messy. Um, if I give you a health, health service example, um, some of you will be familiar with the NHS England um, National Programme for IT, which has been running sort of since about 2002. Their original output-based specification, the, the stuff that they sent out to the suppliers, was hundreds of pages long. Right? It had sheets of individual requirements, desires, and benefits, you know, a pound here, a few minutes there. Um, Simply on the project for digital x-rays, PACs, there was a 15-page table of required benefits. And I worked on the bid team in BT that were responding to that. And naturally, as a supplier, we had to tick every box on the 15 pages to say, yes, we will do this, that, and the other. Because if we didn't, you know, uh, our bid would be rejected. But it was so granular and so unnecessary, rather than sort of, looking at the, the concept of digital x-rays mean you know, x-rays are not lost, therefore people are not x-rayed more times than they need to be, the information is already available wherever everybody needs it, and so on. One of the other problems with, with being granular about this is on project and program terms, it's almost like having an individual person responsible for each chess piece. So rather than playing the game as a whole, 
they skip off and make sure that they're at G3 and they sit there. You know, I've done my bit. They don't take part as a team. They don't work for an overall sort of solution or, or result. They don't support their teammates. So starting with the end in mind, ending at the right time, knowing when to stop is important. Which brings us back to sort of a definition of what actually is a benefit. Um, so many business cases have benefits in them, and so many of those benefits are descriptions of functionality in the system or outcomes. Um, here's a fairly stupid example. My car is painted police car white. White paint is a feature of the car in the same way as a big engine and a wheel at each corner are features of the car. The outcome of having a car that looks like a police car is that I leave the office, I go tanking down the motorway in the fast lane, people see me in their rear view mirrors, think it might possibly be a police car, and they pull over, I have a clear road home. The measurable outcome being that I get home for six o'clock. It only becomes a benefit when I do something with that measurable outcome, the what's in it for me. And in my case, I get to watch The Simpsons, which is my favorite TV program. It winds me down. It means I'm less stressful. Um, I'm less of a burden on my family. Everybody wins. That's my benefit. Um, as far as my wife's concerned, she loathes the program. It is a serious disbenefit to her. So stakeholder and perception. Who is it for? What do they value out of it? And all too often, we concentrate on the wrong benefits. We have business cases full of stuff that are what I call sort of the carrots, encouraging the donkey to move. It's sort of the stuff for individual players. If we do something, then you will save five minutes, and somebody else will gain three pounds fifty a week or whatever. And we concentrate purely on the little bits, the treats that get people to play nicely in our projects. What we should be concentrating on is picking the strategic benefits. It's not the carrots to get the donkey to move. It's the cargo that's in the back of the cart. That's the bit that we really, really ought to concentrate on. Likewise, the stakeholders. Um, Stakeholders in a project, same project, different intentions. So here's Henry V at the gates of half were wanting to take the castle. What's in it for him? It's power, it's control. He needs that castle because it is a strategic asset. For the guy behind him who's going to storm the walls, he's basically interested in loot and drink. Same project, different stakeholders, different requirements and intentions. I'm not going to do any sort of detail on stakeholder analysis. It's covered lots of times, and I'm sure people are very familiar with it. But just to sort of point out, the important thing is who are the key stakeholders? You know, who are the ones that you really need to concentrate on? What will they gain? What will they lose? And what impact will they have upon your objectives? So identifying who these people are, what they get out of the program, also then helps you to start managing them. Yeah, to, so that yeah, they're either actively involved or they're not hindering you, yeah, or if they are hindering you, are you doing the right project? Yeah, is it the right thing to do? So I'll skip over that because I think that's fairly familiar, which brings me to the benefits dependency network. Right. Of all the tools in benefits management, this is the one that I really think everybody should play with. Um, it's a chain of cause and effect. From left to right, it says enabler, feature, activity, outcome, benefit, objective, and driver. Uh, um, so, in more simple terms, let's look at it as means, the features and functions, the, the resources that you have to hand. This is the stuff you've got to play with. The ways in the middle. This is what you're going to do with it. And if we treat this diagram as a sort of an end state picture of, of your new solution, it's if I have these means, these are the ways that they will be used in practice. 
And on the right hand side are the ends that you wish to achieve. In terms of measurable outcomes, i.e. get home by six o'clock, you know, save a few minutes on a, a transaction here, um, save a few pounds on expense there. The benefit, why that is valuable, and the objective that it contributes to, the piece of strategy for your organization that says this is the right sort of benefit to have. And the things that sit on the outside, the drivers are the externals, the things that make you need to act. You know, there may be instructions from above, um, they may be your own personal choices. You know, this is the stuff we need to do something, the objectives are the things that we need to do, and so on. And you can approach this diagram in two directions. Um, you often see benefits dependency networks with arrows going left to right, from, from means through to ends. I prefer to leave it out um, because, as I say, you can come at it from both ends. If you look at it from left to right, um, you've got the tool and what it does and what you do with it. And often you find that that's what you're presented with. Here's a solution. You know, we're putting the new system in on Wednesday, whether you like it or not. Okay, if I've got to have it, what can I do with it? What will it achieve for me? Why would I want to use it? The more sort of strategic aspect is to look at this diagram from the right. I have drivers, uh, so if I need to make efficiency savings. Um, I need to improve the quality of service I deliver to my residents. Okay, so what are my what are my objectives? Taking it right to left, it's what do you want? What do you need to see? Benefits has been evidence that your objectives are being met. Outcomes, what do you need to provide? You know, the, the actual tangible results through to what is the solution? So left to right is tactical and you ask the why questions. Why would I want to use this tool because of what it does? Well, why do I need to do that? And so on. The strategic right to left, you ask the how questions. How will I meet my objectives by achieving the benefits I need? How will I achieve those benefits through having the measurable outcomes? And, and so on. And it's not just for projects. Um, benefits management has a history from IT projects. Now, it came from Cranfield's um, Information Systems Research Center. There are various other people that have done benefits as well. Um, this is a sort of core that I came from. It's applicable to organizations. So here's a fairly generic one. The drivers are analyzed by PESEL, uh, the, the political, economic, etc., which is just simply a business school way of analyzing the business context that you work in, the, the, the environment. The objectives um, here are broken down by balanced scorecard. They don't have to be, but it's a nice, neat way of doing it. Benefits by individual stakeholder or stakeholder group. And on the left hand side, the enablers, traditional change management of people, process, and technology. And the little orange oval on the bottom left hand corner is the outside stuff, the things on which you're dependent but you can't control. Uh, the, the, the partners, perhaps, in a project, the, the, the funding from outside, that sort of thing. And this is sort of generic. Um, it's something to take away and play with. It's far more fun to actually stick post-it notes on a wall and, and play with these th than it is to stare at them on PowerPoint slides. And what you need to do to build this is to have a workshop. You, you can do a lot of work, obviously, sort of sitting at a desk doing background analysis. But to really get the value out of this model, you get the right people, depending on your con um, the context, the environment, They've got to be a mix of people who understand the processes and also the people who control the levers of power and can make the changes. And whether that's a broad spread across your organization or concentrating on the middle management depends entirely on your circumstances and what works best for you. But getting people together and sticking the post-it notes on the wall and moving them around, that's the sort of thing that really works for this sort of uh, model and diagram. Which brings me, I suppose, to why do it? Um, 
now hopefully this is readable on your screens the the text is fairly small this is something I built over time from my own experience that this is the benefits of benefits management in public service um, so if we take the driver it's pretty generic it's maintain or enhance the standing of the public service delivery unit to enable it to deliver substantial improvements so, so that may be your, your council as a whole, your, your department, um, you know, your, your mixed economy, whatever. This is something that, as I say, it's, it's fairly generic. This is what you want to do is basically do your jobs better. So two simple objectives for applying benefits management are to enable the unit to outperform its expectations, you know, to under-promise and over-deliver and to accelerate the performance improvement. You know, if you're going to improve, then you know, let's do it quicker. Um, pace and scale tend to be a, a phrase that is used quite regularly. Yeah. We will deliver more, we will deliver it faster. So the benefits here are we're going to improve our use of resources, we're going to improve our customer satisfaction, we're going to meet the increased demand for public services and we'll improve the image of this public service. Again, sort of fair, four fairly generic benefits. Um, certainly coming from the health service point of view, there do tend to be sort of four, shall we say, usual suspects when it comes to benefits. That's improving the quality of care delivered, improving the quantity of care delivered, um, raising the patient service user experience and meeting the financial requirements yeah, i.e. do it all but spend nothing or, or spend less than you previously were and most as I say, mo most health service projects I've been involved in have, have had those four there is always a danger with this that you apply the wrong benefits um, and again going back to health service improving patient care crops up in every project and sometimes it's not necessarily appropriate if your project is simply to repaint the, the, the lines on the car park it's a pretty tenuous link to improving patient care so you know, make sure that your benefits are appropriate if we look at the right hand side uh, sorry the left hand side of this what does benefits management give you in, in, in terms of resources in, in, in features it helps you select the right objectives, it helps you agree the objectives and it communicates those objectives and the way it does that is in basically things like this diagram here, the benefits dependency network is a tool for communicating objectives, you can use it as a plan on a page um, you know, sticking post notes on the wall, you can fill the entire wall, it can get very complicated and it's important sometimes that it does so because what you're doing is modeling your reality what you mustn't do is try and squeeze your reality to, to fit the diagram though obviously you can take that sort of core wall size model and simplify it reduce it down into something that's manageable on a PowerPoint slide or a sheet of A3 that people can still look at and get the whole picture We use benefits management, so going back to the Venn diagram, things like partner relationships and solution design. So we're agreeing objectives with our partners to help us design a solution, which means that suppliers understand the customer's return on investment, the what's in it for me statement, the benefits that are required by the various stakeholders are in there. And everybody understands, okay, this is what people want to get out of this, Therefore, our solution has got to meet their return on investment, the, the desire for value for money, or, or indeed their intangible requirements. Which gets us to the clear and agreed acceptance criteria. This project will succeed when benefits have been de delivered, rather than this project will succeed when the kit has been delivered to time and budget. And if we've got clear acceptance criteria, 
it means we can improve our project success. Yeah? If we know what we're doing it for in the first place, we can make sure that it actually does that. And if we understand what good acceptance criteria are, then it helps us to select our service improvement project. Um, you know, when you're going through a number of projects to decide which ones to run with and which ones to drop, you know, this is the sort of thing that helps you. Clear and agreed acceptance criteria, say project one, yeah, does it all, project two, no, not necessarily. And from these we get an increased demand for public services possibly, it meets the increased demand, our projects will meet the requirements and hopefully will improve our customer satisfaction as well. So rather than go through more, um, hopefully, if my next slide will wake up, thank you. Those are some examples where I've done it in practice. Um, if I take the top one, assisting customer strategies, the event itself, um, this is rather old, so uh, some of you may remember the days of entitlement cards, some of the early days of the Labour government, late 90s, early 2000s. We ran an exercise, um, BT were obviously wanting to get into the, the game of providing cards and the IT around it. Home Office BT Sintegra Joint Forum on Identity Cards. We had a bunch of the great and the good meet in a hotel in London and we went through the, what are the benefits of doing identity cards? for A, the government, B, the supply side, the people who provide the cards and the management system around it, and C, the general public. And the benefits for government and the card suppliers, terrific, lots of ideas, lots of benefits, all good stuff. Then we got down to sort of, okay, so what does Joe Public get out of this? Not a great deal. There was very little that came out of there that couldn't be done by other existing systems. Yeah? You have credit cards, the credit cards identify you and all that sort of stuff. So what we came up with was a solution that said this doesn't supply answers to one of the key stakeholders. Um, I can't say that it actually sort of went into changing government policy, but it certainly identified the fact that there was something missing in what they wanted to achieve a major stakeholder wasn't getting any value out of this, therefore why do it? If we take the other one, understanding the customer's ROI, this was to do with the highways department. Um, they were going to put it out to tender, public finance initiative, so basically um, sort of outsource their highways maintenance. And we did the workshop with them and it was all down to providing mobile technology, sort of um, mobile phones to road gangs so that what they could do was report any faults in the road system, um, potholes, um, you know, some barriers, all that sort of stuff in real time rather than sort of going off and doing an audit every so often or relying on members of the public ringing up and complaining. So this was something to do with mobile working and we started from the premise that this was going to be sort of an efficient way of using staff time and then sort of out of the blue in the middle of the, this discussion was if we're going to put this out to sort of privatization, if we don't understand the state of our roads, there's a large amount of risk um, and the people who are going to bid for this contract are going to say, if we accept the risk, we're going to charge you a lot of money, just in case your roads are in a worse state than you believe them to be. However, if we put this mobile system in place and we have a better understanding of the state of roads and the requirements of the road maintenance, we reduce the risk, therefore we reduce the contract cost. So instead of saving a few thousand pounds in sort of efficiency and test staff time and this sort of thing, suddenly this was millions of pounds off a contract cost. And it turned the project out, sort of around instantly. Um, instead of it simply being, yeah, it, it's something nice to have, but we're not quite sure why we need to do it. Suddenly, sort of, well, yeah, 
this is it. This is a game changer. If we can do this, we can save millions of pounds over the next 20 years or whatever. It was a huge saving. And that was one of the things that came out of a benefits workshop. It, was sort of, it wasn't expected, but just simply by doing the workshop and sticking the post-it notes, it triggered ideas and it changed the scope of the project entirely. Um, other things that we've done, and I'm just trying to think of perhaps another one. Again, acceptance criteria, clear and agreed acceptance criteria. Um, the project there was to do with putting burglar alarms into social housing. Um, the, the system was going to work again off mobile phones, so it was sort of a wireless box on the wall which would sort of send telemetry out to a, a contact center. So if the alarm went off, uh, it was all done over the mobile phone. Um, eventually it got sold as a, an individual product and you could buy from B&Q and places like that. But the initial idea was that it would be bought by a, a local authority to put into all its social housing stock. And the acceptance criteria, the workshop, we, we did it as a sort of focus group. We actually got people from the area in and got their ideas of, of what was good for them and, and all the rest of it. Um, and the acceptance criteria of that was the fact that this was a huge buy-in from the people who lived in the houses. Um, it was um, heavily um, ethnic minority based sort of um, estate. Most of them were um, Pakistani Kashmiri, I think. And one of the big things they had was, um, as a sort of a simple example, going off to family weddings. For years, they'd had to leave somebody behind to look after the house because nobody ever felt that the whole family could go off to a family wedding and leave their house unoccupied because it would be burgled in the time that they were gone. And simply by having an alarm and some system and knowing that all the houses in this state were alarmed um, and there was nowhere else for burglars to go apart from out into somebody else's estate, but for the first time in years, there were families who thought they could actually sort of turn up and do the whole family wedding and do it properly. And this was a big deal for the people that uh, we talked to. But again, it was something that we wouldn't have picked up without actually sort of working through the system with them in the workshop. Um, funding win rate, improved funding win rate. Um, okay, this is going to sound a bit commercial because at the time it was to do with joint ventures. So again, I, I was sort of come at it from a commercial supplier working with a local authority to, to do joint ventures. But it's also applicable internal. Now, we have internal customers and suppliers. We compete for funding with other public sector bodies. So rather than sort of winning business, I've, I've put it as winning funding. Now, building a good solid description of what are the benefits of my uh, project, what do I hope to achieve by it, using the benefits dependency network that takes you through this whole sort of chain of cause and effect. If I have this, this is what I do, this is what I get, builds a tremendously strong business case. Um, I uh, say, so working with customers and suppliers, yeah, customers, what is it we want to achieve on the right-hand side? Suppliers, how will my solution make these connections? Builds tremendous cases, and it helps to win the funding. On a more sort of, um, shall we say, cynical basis, as a supplier, if you're taking your customer and working with them through this process with you, they're committing time and interest into your solution. And to be cynical, as I say, it, it's a matter of if they're doing it with you, they haven't got time to do it with all your uh, competitors. And it also builds a relationship. So it's definitely something to, to consider, as I say, even internal projects. I suppose it's also something to be wary of with your, with your suppliers. But play the game from your angle. This is what we want to achieve. Therefore, the solution must meet our aims. Yeah. And we, we know what we need to achieve. Therefore, we know what the market position is going to be on it. 
I suppose the final one I just want to cover is successful customer change management. Um, this one, internet for the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, they had numerous small intranets, they aggregated them into one, a 90,000 seat intranet. Obviously a major change program, um, let's say 90,000 staff involved in the thing, simply as uses of the new system across the whole of England, so obviously a lot of geography to cover as well. Putting benefits management in, um, it helped them with their change management. And we're back to why are we doing this? If we know why we're doing it, then we have to have a solution that works. And it's not just simply having a kit that works, it's having the working practice designed to exploit that technology to make the most of it. And what we did from that one was, by applying benefits management, we created a business case that got treasury approval where previous business cases had failed. And the permanent secretary at the time saw benefits management as being an excellent idea for proof of future program performance. The reporting that we were doing to get through the business case was something that was then taken forward into the project, so into the program and into life service afterwards. So benefits management helps improve public service in various ways. Um, and that I think is just about it. I sort of finished a little sooner than I thought, so I'm happy to open it up for questions now and uh, we'll see what we, what we can get from that. So David, if you can uh, open up for questions and uh, see the response. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, David, I think we've got about 20 minutes left, so we've got a couple of questions uh, already in. If you have any more to add, then uh, you either use the question box on the left-hand side or raise your hand, and we can uh, and we can get these asked to you. So the first one that we've got here is from Jenny from Inverness Council, uh, from the Highland Council. Um, how do we how do we get our local authorities to consider and focus on non-cash benefits? Yeah, um, it's a good one. Um, there are ways and means of valuing the non-cash ones into cash terms, but sometimes they're a bit more tenuous than others. I'm personally in favour of turning it as much into pound signs as you possibly can, simply because money is the common currency, and it helps you to compare your apples and oranges. So, I suppose sort of the, the non-cash ones, it's looking at things like social return on investment to see what you can do to sort of work it back into something that compares um, on, on a pound value. <sighs> Doing it at the moment in, in the health service, um, it's something that I'm still dabbling with. I haven't got any sort of firm commitment from the people I'm reporting to at the moment. But if we take as a health service example, quality adjusted life years, um, which is a measure of the improvement in your health and well-being. Yeah. So, so it's of how many years will you live um, multiplied by the quality of your life. Um, nice guidelines for drugs are along the lines of if a drug costs more than sort of thirty thousand pounds per quality it's too expensive. Now that's the sort of thing that ends up in the news on a regular basis. The background numbers behind that are sort of from focus groups and academic research. Members of the public value their own quality adjusted life year at £60,000. So if we can use that then you can well, make your um, non-cash benefits into pound signs by converting them. The tricky bit is actually knowing how much quality of life your project is increasing. If you don't know what the change in quality of life is then obviously you can't sort of convert it into qualities, um, which is why it gets tenuous at times and sometimes it's a bit finger in the air. The, the firm measures that I've seen done are a thing called PROMS, which is patient recorded um, outcome measures but they are limited to things like hip and knee replacements. It's not been spread out across the rest of the NHS. But the methodology exists in, in various forms, it's just a question of applying it. If you can't get that, then 
we're back into the stakeholder and the what's in it for them. And your non-cash benefits become almost your project sponsor's willingness to pay. Yeah. Um, I think that this change, this improvement in customer satisfaction is worth the £10,000 that this project is going to cost. At which point the benefit becomes your sponsor's benefit. Yeah. Um, the benefit is I want to see improvement in my customer satisfaction and I'm prepared to pay £10,000 to get it. That's why it becomes very subjective. And I feel I'm waffling at that point, but hopefully I've covered the, the, the answer for the time being. Okay, so the next one's from Louise from Aberdeen University. At what point of a project would you recommend holding a benefits workshop? As soon as possible. In, in my perfect world, the benefits workshops will be done at project and program inception. And that this is the sort of decision making that says, this is the sort of project that we ought to be doing. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen that often in practice. And what tends to happen is decisions have been made at a reasonably high level. You know, here is the project, we're going to do it, now go away and realize the benefits. And at that point you end up doing a benefits dependency uh, a workshop, which is, it's the tactical, it's the left to right bit that says, this is a solution that we're going to implement, what can you get out of it? It still has value at that point, but not necessarily as much as it would have had, had you done the thing up front. Um, most of my benefits work in the past 20 years has been remedial. It, it's been, okay, project's up and running, what are we going to get out of it? So uh, I think the simple answer is as soon as possible, but recognize that it's going to happen at some point. And ju just make it a, uh, make the best of it as you can. Okay, so the next one's from my colleague Phil from the Improvement Service. Do you think that benefits maps benefit more senior stakeholders or all staff? Obviously, it shows how individual activity contributes to overarching benefits, but do chief execs need this level of detail? Right. Um, the summary diagram, the one that ends up on the PowerPoint slide, is very good for execs. Right? The, this is the sort of the reason why we're doing things condensed into a picture that you can see in in one screen's worth. Um, the other points sort of at an individual staff level, this is a terrific exercise for buy-in. Like the building of the benefits dependency network is great for getting people involved. Um, if you imagine sort of one of the little orange boxes in here, the, the activity side of things, that's somebody's job. That's what they're actually going to do. And what they can see from the diagram is, if you give me this piece of kit, this is how I can do my job. And these are all the benefits that hang off me doing my job properly. Yeah. And what they get to see is, you know, all right, I may be a small cog, but this is what I contribute to. Um, and approached properly, you know, it's terrific in, in the way of get, getting buy-in. The important thing to be wary of is I've seen these exercises used simply as a stakeholder engagement exercise. You know, let's get everybody in, give them tea and biscuits, let them stick some post-it notes on a wall, and they'll all go home feeling warm and fuzzy and appreciated. But what happens is that the actual quality of the diagram isn't up to much. Yeah, and it doesn't get used, or, or perhaps worse, it does get used when it shouldn't do. So, uh, so it's, I suppose it, it, you know, it, it works for both people. It, it works for execs as being something uh, constructive that they can see on one page as a buy-in, as a motivating tool as well, it's brilliant. It really is. Okay, and the final question that we have for now is from uh, Sophia from uh, Transport Scotland. How are this benefits accounted for as there is, there's a risk of concentrating on positive benefits only? Yeah. Um, my personal preference is that I net off the disbenefit on the individual benefit. Right, so, I don't know, um, 
if we say here, meet the increased demand for public services, while we're measuring that benefit, we're also measuring the detrimental effects that might be hanging around it. Um, so the disbenefit is sort of wrapped up within the background documentation of that benefit that says, okay, I don't know, if, if it was a cost saving, yeah, it will save us £10,000, but by the way, it, the disbenefit is that we'll have to invest £5,000 to get it, so the net benefit is, is £5,000. Other people tend to group the disk benefits almost as a separate set. Um, so, so you have all the benefits down and then you have a separate table of all the disk benefits. And then just simply aggregate the two at the end of the day. The problem I have with that one is that you do risk sort of dissociating the disk benefit with, with you know, the, the activity that's around it. Uh, so, 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 oh, look at this project, it's brilliant, it's got lots of benefits. Oh, by the way, we have to make 14 staff redundant, uh, we have to cease service to three of our locations out of 15 or, or whatever. But that becomes sort of an add-on, an appendix to the business case. And people don't see the direct link, which is why I'm, to say, more keen on linking each this benefit to the benefit that it relates to, rather than comping them together at the end. Okay, so that's great. So um, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. So we're finishing up a little bit early at, um, at 20 past. So I'd like to once again... Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say that like, on the grounds that I was worried I might sort of run a little short, I do have a couple more slides just to sort of cover off... Um, right. The thing about manageability um, is something to be... Consider so, so if I can just take five minutes on this and, and then we'll wind up no if problem. that's okay with Yeah, of course. Right. Um, doing the benefits dependency network. It's a, it's, it's a model of reality rather than squeezing your reality into a model. Um, this is an example taken from a, a health service project of about eight years ago now. Uh, it's to do with emergency care practitioners, which was um, sort of ambulances in laybys, um, paramedics, that sort of thing. What it had that it says this is manageable. It has three objectives, which which are fairly straightforward but big and required. It has three benefits, yeah, which again are significant benefits and they're valued by the people that wanted it. And there are links. Yeah, everything is connected. Everything else. This is a nice, simple, straightforward benefits dependency network for three benefits for three objectives. Again, going back to my history, um, most business cases I used to deal with worked on the basis of the more benefits, the more chance of getting business approval. Yeah. It was quantity rather than quality. Once you start mapping that, it gives you a feeling for what's feasible within your project. Yeah. Th this is why the diagram is better than sort of tables of bullet points within business cases. If you imagine that your project had wanted 50 benefits instead of three, that's what your diagram begins to look like. All those benefits, therefore all that business activity and all that resource is needed. And suddenly you think, well, behind each of those boxes is at least one item of work. There's a work package, there's something to be done, there's money to be spent, there's kit to be put in place and your 50 benefits suddenly become rather unfeasible. Yeah. And the fact that you realize that those 50 benefits are the penny packets, that the, the carrots for the donkey. And you know, in reality, they're never actually going to get measured. They're not going to get tracked. And, and frankly, you know, why bother doing it? You can take a business case and break it down and, and sort of deconstruct it into a diagram and suddenly you discover that sort of what you thought was a sensible project is not necessarily once you see all this lot in place. Yeah. So that's manageable, but that one isn't. So that was it. That's just simply one I wanted to cover the, in the last few minutes. So I'm done unless there's another question or two. Um, no, no more questions come in. Um, but once again, I'd like to thank you for, 
thank you for, uh, for taking the time out to present to us today, David. Um, if you I've have enjoyed any, it. Um, we will be following up with uh, this with a survey just say uh, regarding the quality of the webinar and the recording will also be posted online both in the Knowledge Hub and on YouTube. Um, links links will follow us uh, along with the slides. So once again, thank you very much for uh, presenting and thank you for your attendance and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.